back, everyone. Uh, my name is Yanis Paleologos with the uh, Kathmerini newspaper. And uh, this session is called Unleashing the Greek Economy uh, with a special emphasis on the tourism sector. Um, and we all know uh, how important uh, the prospects uh, for Greek growth are uh, for the country. Uh, we heard yesterday from the Minister of Development and Investment, Mr. Yuriadis, uh, who pointed out that the increasing the growth rate is basically a sine qua non, that thing without which uh, nothing else can succeed for, for the government and for the country. Uh, we are expecting the third consecutive year of growth this year, but growth will clock in under uh, 2%, and that's uh, nowhere near enough to, uh, for the country to begin to make up the uh, vast amounts of lost ground that it lost during the, the 10 years of crisis. Uh, we're very lucky to have with us uh, a fantastic, diverse panel of uh, high-powered individuals who will walk us through the uh, uh, opportunities, the prospects, but also the challenges uh, involved in uh, pushing uh, the Greek economy into a higher gear. And uh, so without further ado, let me introduce the Minister for Tourism, uh, Mr. Haris Theoharis, who will uh, give us his take on how to make uh, Greek tourism, uh, the country's heavy industry, even more successful. You go to the podium? Okay. Yeah, in the sure. interest of uh, trying to stick to the time, although I'm sure that I will not resist taking some comments off, off my speech, but uh, if let's, you, let's if try to stick to as much if, as possible. If you go on too long, I'll start coughing furiously <laughs> into the... <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Simos, all the organizers, uh, uh, Andy, and uh, of course uh, the sponsors for making this uh, uh, wonderful process uh, possible. And uh, to have to give me a chance to be back in Washington and see old friends and uh, um, reminisce about uh, other different times and different events. Um, of course, this is a, an important pivot, if you like, that coincides as well. Um, and I'm wishing every success to, to this uh, conference and many for many many years to come. It coincides with the pivot, the political pivot that Greece has. Uh, seen since the elections of um, this year. During the last decade, <coughs> uh, entering now, if you like, the, the main point of my speech, the G GDP of Greece suffered a substantial growth um, drop, excuse me. Three massive public debt financing programs, fiscal adjustment and structural reforms uh, included, prevented the collapse of the economy, but produced a lot of uncertainty, high unemployment, and a significant fall in investment. Now, the government change, as I said, is a pivot. It has signaled a positive turn for this economy. And um, the Greek economy has started to perform at above average rate. The yields, for example, of the government bonds have fallen surprisingly sharply. Uh, the credit rating agencies have set the country into an uh, uptrend rating path, which the latest, uh, um, if you like, news is that uh, this upgrading path seems to be picking up, especially after the Hercules um, NPL reduction uh, scheme comes into effect. I think we will see uh, a very quick upgrading. And the Central Bank of Greece has lifted all the capital controls, re-establishing completely free flow of capital again. <clears throat> now, this positive turn took place largely thanks to a reformist agenda that this government has put forward. And you had the chance, some um, uh, remarks about this agenda to, to uh, hear yesterday and, uh, of course, today. Tax and contribution rate reductions, business licensing simplification, investment incentives, labor market liberalization are all part of a continuous effort to turn Greece to an investment destination of first preference and absolute excellence, uh, together coupled with symbolic, emblematic projects that have been um, uh, unblocked in order to ensure that we give the right signals to the business community. And of course, I'm referring mainly to the Illinicum project, but many others as well. Most of them of touristic nature, of uh, touristic interest. We as policymakers consider tourism as a strategically important sector, a sector that can attract long-term foreign investment, create employment and promote growth in the periphery of the country. In 2018, inbound tourism to Greece was at an all-time high with more than 33 million 
arrivals, an increase of almost 10% on 2017. 2019 will be, for tourism, again, an all-time high record year. The difference is that this year we will see single-digit growth in the number of tourists, but does double-digit growth in tourism revenue, and this is the kind of growth that we would like to focus on. Um, not the, quality, uh, the quantity in terms of the number of arrivals, but uh, KPIs that are more of a qualitative nature, how many days they stay, how uh, much they spend per diem, per uh, overnight stay, et cetera, et cetera. So this increase mirrors the rapid improvement of competitiveness of the sector and of the Greek economy overall and the strengthening of the Greek tourism proposition. Revenues follow this trend, uh, but as I said, <coughs> this year, uh, marks a significant change from the previous years and uh, we're hoping that we can actually put in place the strategic initiatives that will keep the kind of growth that I'm uh, describing for the years uh, to come. Now, impressive tourist performance is not leaving <coughs> domestic and foreign investors. Large chains and hotel management companies are entering the Greek market dynamically. Actually, I see many of them in my office um, every few days, and they um, describe plans to either enter the market or enter with more earnest, and they already have a small footprint, and they want to uh, increase that fo footprint and uh, uh, dip their <coughs> toes in the water uh, of uh, different destinations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, an example is, when I visited recently Yanana, and a big hotel chain mentioned that if there are uh, hotels uh, for sale there, they're interested, I mean, they're doing the management, but they have also a host of investors uh, with them, uh, which they can bring in in an area, and they expressed interest uh, in uh, that area. Yanana, a few years ago, was totally off the map, was uh, nowhere to be found in terms of uh, tourism, and now, it's, uh, uh, it's existent and uh, with high prospects uh, for investment. So, investment, thank you very much. Investment in tourism is moving forward. <coughs> it's a sector where the country has and had an astounding performance, even during the crisis year, and the plethora of successful projects are underway and many more just started to attract uh, uh, international uh, attention. Now, uh, as I mentioned, the interest is uh, sound, uh, especially in the Firebrand Islands, in the list of assets that are under disposal by the Greek state. Uh, and the Greek state has a number of um, projects that we're hoping that we can kickstart in the uh, next few months, especially when ETAD, which is the main um, state-owned company that uh, has ownership of those assets, um, completes the, the changes in, uh, uh, in the board of directors and uh, the CEO, et cetera, <coughs> et cetera, which will ally and align at that with the plan of the Greek government to ensure that we have uh, good development of public uh, assets in the tourism uh, sector. Now, from the first day, from uh, the uh, first discussion of our program in Parliament, we mentioned that we need to create uh, a long-term tourism strategy. So a tourism strategy that needs to build on themes that are known, for example, a 365 destination, diversification in all three areas, especially new destinations, temporarily extending the season, and uh, uh, qualitatively um, uh, in, in terms of the types of products that we provide. Diversification upon is the name of the game, uh, but as well other issues like um, um, uh, the, the, the quality, uh, the high, higher service quality of a product, um, the authenticity of a product, and also its um, uh, green credentials in ensuring that we have a development that uh, can last uh, throughout, uh, throughout the years. Now, our main targets, of course, are, as I mentioned, to improve the competitiveness of the national tourism product in uh, quality, authenticity, resilience, and sustainability. I have to mention resilience because we saw in the, uh, the past uh, summer a number of incidents that um, we had the 
um, uh, we were obliged to act very quickly upon from hurricanes in Harkiviki to uh, the collapse of Thomas Cook. And that means um, that we need to start thinking uh, more long term in terms of the fact factors that might hit our product, both as an acute uh, one-off incident, uh, but uh, also the long-term risks like uh, climate change or climate catastrophe, or some, some people mentioned, and what that will do to the uh, kind of tourism product that we uh, have. And the second area of a strategy is to boost investment <coughs> to ensure that we play a role in the change of tactic of uh, the Greek government. The Greek government has, um, the government of Kyriakos Mitsotakis, um, has put as a central pillar the fact that we now have to be a growth-led economy versus an austerity-led economy. We have to now be, um, uh, change, change the, what comes first, uh, as we have within those three uh, adjustment programs, we have uh, ensured that we have fiscal stability. Now is the time to ensure that we have pro-growth uh, policies that will give us more space in terms also of the fiscal uh, side as well. So I will briefly mention the five axes the, of the National Tourism Strategy Plan, which we have started to develop <coughs> in order to uh, complete within uh, 2020, a plan that will apply for the next uh, 10 years, and this is something, if you like, that was missing from the um, uh, logic of the Greek Ministry of Tourism to have a much more long-term strategy in place, visible, uh, validated, uh, and so that we can help investors and um, uh, operators, stakeholders of the tourism industry to um, uh, navigate the tourism. I'm, I'm finishing with the five, five uh, titles and then I'm done. So, high standards infrastructure, improvement of the licensing framework to attract high quality investments and eliminate red tape, respect to sustainability principles, constant improvement of accessibility and interconnection by enhancing the country's air connections. Uh, to that respect, we are advocating we did so yesterday, we'll do so in December when we are in New York, that we need to have direct flight connectivity um, between the US and Greece during the winter as well through uh, a US carrier. Um, optimal management of the tourism experience to make it increasingly qualitative and attractive by enhancing inter alia sustainable destination management and tourism education and redesigning of the tourism product, redefinition of its brand and communication plan to reflect the engagement in quality, authenticity, resilience, sustainability, and value for money. So the future of uh, the tourism industry in Greece looks uh, very promising. The Ministry of Tourism and GNTO are here to help any interested party, either that they want to do business with Greece through operators, other uh, tourism enterprises or that want to do investment in Greece and we're here to um, hold their hand and help them navigate through the sometimes difficult red tape waters of the Greek state uh, and to be successful for a win-win situation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. And uh, moving right along to uh, Deborah Wynne Smith, who is the President and CEO of the US Council on Competitiveness, who will talk to us about the four factors that can contribute to turning Greece into a dynamic, uh, innovation driven economy. Good morning. Um, I want to just start by thanking someone who has played a huge role in deepening and furthering the U.S.-Greek relationship that we've been talking about over the last day, and not just in content and substance, but in forging relationships and partnerships, and that's Simi and Samokas who created the Delphi Economic Forum. <laughs> really. And uh, I had the honor to be there the first year and have seen the growth and the impact, and of course now bringing Delphi Economic Forum to Washington is another strategic move. So thank you very much, Simeon, for your leadership. Um, we've all heard how Greece is really at a, an inflection point, both in its economy, in national security, its role in the region, the Balkans, and of course, um, the Pacific area of the Eastern Mediterranean. 
Uh, clearly, I think this is the time now for Greece to begin to capitalize upon its potential to be an innovation-driven economy and to really emerge as a leader in the 21st century innovation uh, world that we're living in. Um, I'm going to just share with you sort of three platforms that are going to enable countries and regions to move into this future and then share a few highlights of where Greece fits in in these. And this work is really emerging from the U.S. Council on Competitiveness. We've launched a major five-year national commission on innovation and competitiveness frontiers. And we spent a lot of time really understanding what are the three essential platforms. The first one is how nations will accelerate the development, deployment, and commercialization at scale of these emerging, converging, exponential technologies. The second platform is how are we going to leverage the future of production, sustainable consumption and use of energy, and the future of work. That's a big platform. And the third is how to optimize the innovation systems that either enable, hinder, or stop the success of the first two platforms. So I'm going to start with the third because this is where Greece has made a lot of progress and if it continues on a journey of reform, it will unleash great potential to address the first two. So this innovation optimization of systems deals with everything from capital cost structures, access to financing, tax and fiscal policy, the regulatory environment, standards, intellectual property protection, big critical infrastructures today, cyber infrastructure is huge here, and then of course, how a country engages in global trade and partnerships around the world. So again, the Mitsotakis government has unleashed a new path to, in my view, really focus on pro-growth, pro-business strategies and reforms that will enable Greece to be really innovation friendly to optimize the other two platforms. So let me turn to the first, accelerating the development, deployment, and commercialization of these technologies at scale. Yes, there are tremendous issues around research and development, I'll talk about that, but the most important thing that a nation has is its talent, its people, 21st century oil. Greece, as we know, is a great producer of talent and skilled, educated people through a very sophisticated, fine university system. But where have these people gone? What are they doing? Are they contributing to this component of the innovation future in Greece? Well, we know for the most part the answer is no. And I believe the reforms and the things underway and the third optimization of systems is going to enable a lot of people who are educated to stay in Greece and begin to flourish there. So talent is absolutely important. Research and development. Greece has a very low intensity of research and development in the private sector compared to other OECD countries. The government is doing the majority of R&D. We need to see more private sector companies in Greece invest in R&D and very importantly develop the public-private partnerships to commercialize that and accelerate it. Patenting is very low in Greece, a low patent. Although I will say Greece, in not all sectors, but in some, is doing a very good job on the protection of intellectual property. Not so well on copyrights. And of course we all know in Athens there are a lot of things that are being sold that shouldn't be sold. But having said that, that's a huge issue for what? Capitalizing value from innovation, but also attracting high value investment to do high value work. So that is an area that needs attention. And the third on entrepreneurship. A recent study looked at 54 countries on the readiness of their people to go out and be entrepreneurs. Well, we know Greece has a history of entrepreneurship, small and medium sized businesses. I mean, just look around the, the diaspora of this country, Australia, others where Greek entrepreneurs are incredibly successful, they've built businesses, they've become wealthy, et cetera, et cetera. Out of these 54 countries, Greece ranks 47th. That's not a good metric. So those things need to be addressed in this first bucket. 
The other thing that's very important in this whole area of the revolutionary technologies, and this has been discussed a little bit yesterday, is that everything will be digital. It will all be enabled by digital resilient cyber platforms. This is why the issue of securing the digital infrastructures is so important. This is why investors in the defense arena and other sectors will not put high value assets in countries where the cyber infrastructure is weak or compromised. And this is interesting in Greece because you have a lot of talent in the IT space. You know, you have the potential to be leaders in cybersecurity. I share the view of others. I'm very concerned about the Huawei and Chinese penetration. We talk about the Costco port. All the automation, all the control of robots, all the things that will be done there will be based on their platforms. Those are very serious issues. And then finally, the second one, leveraging the future of production, the energy transformations, and work. There has to be a closer alliance between business and labor and education to train for the jobs of the future. And I'm very proud, as is Drake Bacharis, to be on the Board of Trustees of the American College of Greece. They're doing some amazing things to link education and programs to where the jobs are in the future and also to commercialize technologies. Greece, in my view, and I think some of you know, I'm a Bronze Age archaeologist. I've lived in Greece. I love Greece. I've done archaeological research there. I believe from the time I lived in Greece to now, Greece was de-industrialized. You don't make things anymore. And you have to start making things in addition to being a great service economy. And the beauty of this is that to make things now, you don't need the huge infrastructure of plants. There's additive manufacturing with the digital. There are many opportunities to have a true made in Greece renaissance. And Mr. Minister, I will have to say this. I hope when I come back to Greece, and I always want to be there as a tourist and a, and a partner and friend, when we go to the shops, we don't find all the tourist things made in China. <laughs> That's not good. There was a tremendous tradition of handicrafts and art and all of it. This needs to be revised. So let me just close by saying the new competitiveness council in Greece called Compete Greece is really going to be a very important agent for change, private sector led. Uh, the former president of the American Hellenic Chamber, Simos Anastanopoulos, has put together a great group of, of leaders. I urge all of you to participate and support that and work with the government um, in developing these policies and reforms and aggressive innovation strategy. The other exciting news I want to share, and I want to thank the Delphi Economic Forum, the leadership of Piraeus Bank, the leadership of the Athens Stock Exchange, they are all members of the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils that's chaired by the chairman of Royal Dutch Shell. We uh, now have 35 countries in this organization focused on developing competitiveness innovation of our respective countries. We were just in Kazakhstan in 2020. We will be in Australia, hosted by the Minister of Industry, Trade and Innovation, the Minister of Health, Big Innovation Summit. We are coming to Greece in 2021 and we look forward to working with the Minister of Development and all of the government and private sector leaders, we will probably be bringing 500 leaders from around the world to come to Greece. And this is an important anniversary year. Thanks, so we're very thanks excited. Thanks for supporting <laughs> my stories in Greece. Thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, some very interesting observations, including the fact that uh, we find ourselves in the Greek economy in a bit of a no man's land between the, the industrialized past and the not yet digitized future, which will be the subject. I'm now advertising also the next panel for some reason. Um, now, uh, there was a major study commissioned about the prospects of a Greek economy, and it was done by IHS Market last year. And one of the sectors that it found where Greece could uh, create a lot of added value was uh, aerospace, uh, which was surprising to some people. Uh, and we're very lucky to have with us today uh, Mr. Christian Hadziminas, president of the EFA group, uh, who are doing wonderful things in that space, and who will talk to us about what the more forward-looking and outward-looking uh, Greek medium-sized companies were able to, to do to survive during the crisis, and what prospects there are for U.S. investment 
uh, in such companies. The floor is yours. Of course. All right. Um, first of all, Simeon, thank you for the invitation to my group. Thank you for the invitation to Greek Entrepreneurs Association. Uh, this is just like Deborah said, who, by the way, woke us up her, here with her energy, so it's easier, a little bit easier for me now to have your attention. Um, yeah, it's very important, uh, as you know, to cement uh, bilateral strategic alliances with business, with actual business. And just like Delphi started small and became larger, we hope and we will support as Greek Entrepreneurs Association with this business element, which is important. Okay, so here's the story. What I want to talk to you about is about a goal we all have. It's how to increase the GDP growth to get it up to 5%. We must not be less ambitious uh, anymore. So to do this, we, there are basically two key parameters. First is investments, and secondly is how extrovert is an economy. But as we will see, they both affect each other. Let's talk about investment, but let's not, let's say the truth. Uh, the last years, uh, foreign investments, aside from the large infrastructure projects and aside from some large investments from multinationals, uh, they have not really, they didn't really have attraction in Greece, okay? What was the reason for that? First of all, there was, a, of course, a crazy taxation, uh, unbelievable bureaucracy, uh, especially in the justice area, which is very important for foreign investors. Of course, all this, we believe now with this new government, are going to go away. Uh, we have, a, a, as I call him, a serial killer of obstacles to investment, Mr. Georgiadis, who is not here, I, I guess, right now. But uh, we have, uh, as an entrepreneur's association, we have no doubt that he will eliminate all those obstacles. But there is one big obstacle that no government can easily uh, fight in the case of Greece. Greece was and is a very small market. We have to understand this, despite the fact that we're part of the European Union and so on, and being in a nice uh, location and so on. We are a small market. And that's the reason a lot of people have not focused on Greece. I'm talking about foreign investments. And particularly, as I said before, the whole idea to get to 5% growth, you need to involve the backbone of the Greek economy. What is the backbone of the Greek economy? It's small and medium-sized companies. These companies, as far as we know, they have not really seen. And that has contributed to the fact that foreign investments were not enough to lead us to these high levels of growth. So at uh, Greek Entrepreneurs Association, we say and propose the following, because we want to be very specific all the time. First of all, we proposed uh, marginal taxes of 10% for additional revenues generated by Greek companies. In other words, although they, this government has really reduced taxation, it's only way to reduce it even further, we would like to also to add another shock to the system. The shock is we will, they should, they should, in our opinion, and we've been advocating this the last five or six years, they should give 10% growth uh, taxation on, on growth, that is for companies that have more revenues than they had, more than the GDP growth, they should be taxed differently. This is very important uh, because not only does not affect tax revenues, but also encourages foreign companies, please pay attention to this, encourages foreign companies to give more subcontracting work to Greek companies and also makes those Greek companies, especially the small to medium-sized companies that we want to attract uh, in this whole investment uh, cycle, uh, it gives them, it increases their values. Because if, if this extra taxation, 10%, applies to existing companies, then it's, it's, a, it's a really big incentive. Um, the, the second thing is um, to increase the size of the Greek market, but also to increase the value of those small to medium-sized companies. At Greek Entrepreneurs Association, we really, really encourage uh, Greek companies to not just to wait for foreign investments in Greece, but 
to come out, increase overnight their market by investing in countries and especially the US. We want to be very ambitious. We want not only our members, but all the Greek companies, small to medium size, to come to the US. We want them to invest here. We have a lot of good examples. It started with Titan, okay, it's a big company, Fage, which created the yogurt market. But we also have smaller companies like Gyros, for instance, that they set up in New Jersey. And then we have also Raychem, another engineering company that acquired two companies in the States. This is really what we encourage. And we encourage it not only to make them more attractive so that American companies can invest in them because they all of a sudden they see they have a presence in, in the US in some other strategic markets. That will increase the appetite for even foreign investors to invest the, to Greek government companies. But first they have to invest to come to the US. And also a, a side effect on that is that, you know, uh, we've been trying to uh, attract, uh, to convince Greek Americans to, to invest in Greece. You know what, there's a problem here. The problem is that, first of all, we have not really seen any of these Greek American investments in Greece, at least to a big volume. Secondly, we cannot appeal to people just with the, because they, are, they, they love the country of origin. Let's not forget we have, uh, and I'm sure Nick Larigakis will agree with me, we have, an, we have second and third and fourth generation. Those people are different people. They don't have the link to Greece like their fathers or grandfathers. We have to speak to them on business terms. They still have it inside the Elinas, inside them, but we have to speak with them more and more on more business terms. So this is about the, the investments. Secondly, to give a little bit of a positive note about extrovert. You know, an amazing thing happened. It, and it was amazing because it was unnoticed and it's gradual. All those things, all those years that we had a big crisis, all of a sudden, a lot of Greek companies, and especially the ones you don't know, or they're not noticed, they were forced to look at things differently. And they had, they had to become extrovert. They, have, they had to look outside of Greece. Greece was, was in a mess a few years ago. So what did they do, those companies? And this is the interesting thing. They basically look at what we had in Greece, whether it's products, whether it's recipes, whether it's skills, and I'll speak about with specific examples. They took those things, what was available around them, they transformed them, they rebranded them, they made them products and skills that can be sold on a global level. That's what they did, specific examples, so that we don't get theoretical here. And some of those companies, uh, I'm very proud to, that we have brought as an association here in this conference. Like, let's say in the food sector, we have Rodula. Just, I have to give a specific names here. They had the old recipe of their grandmother, Yaya, as the Greek Americans say here, like a cheese pie and, and sweets. And they made them a global brand and they are expanded here in the States and other, in other countries. We have Fresh Line, which is cosmetics. They, they were also, they are represented here. They were based on some family recipes of how Greek women in the past used to do, you know, their cosmetics and with everything. So they took this and they made it global. This was about the recipes, the skills. Listen to this. In Greece, we have, you know, we had very good skills in some areas like technites, xilurgi, you know, woodworks. Well, here's a company that is also Epexil is represented today. What they did, those guys, which amazed me, and I didn't know until recently, to be honest with you, they took this, they preserved the skills, they preserved the skills, and now they have created a small giant, which basically does architectural woodworks, okay? Custom made, because they used artificial intelligence, they used other things to preserve those skills. Talking about skills, to continue what John said earlier, we also have another area of skills, which is Greek engineering. By the way, Epexil, so that you understand, I, I don't want to forget, this is important, they get now 100 million and 200 million contracts in the States with their woodworks, and all of it, by the way, it's done in Greece. 
but they had to invest to come to the States. They, they spend a lot of money to do that. Okay, that's very important. Yes, I'll be very quick now, I'm towards the end. Skills, Greek engineering, best value for money, I can assure you. I lead a, a group of companies in the aerospace and defense sector. We relied on this Greek engineering, we relied. And now another area where in Greece we had spent a lot of money in defense and we did not really take advantage of it, but there were skilled builds in the country. So now, for the first time, we have exports out of Greece of, of products and services made and designed in Greece in the area of aerospace and defense. And yes, John, aerospace is the next big thing in, in, in Greece. Just like Belgium, every euro of investment in, euro and, and aerospace brings you back six euros back. This is the study, and I'm finishing. Another example about skills is another company that's here, Giselis Robotics. They are a robotics and artificial intelligence implementer and integrator. Not only they use the good Greek engineering and they are exporting, but listen to this, they are also helping the other Greek companies to, to have proper, to come, to go back to industrialization because you have to do it in, in, in modern terms, that is with automation. And indeed, as the Prime Minister said a few weeks ago, we, we do have a rebirth of, of industry in Greece. And it's coming big time. So, I am very optimistic. This is the recipe to get to four or five percent growth, to focus on small and medium-sized companies, expanding overnight their territory, right? And through the right incentive, which we call the government again to, to, to have a look at this, despite the fact that they are in the, definitely in the, in the right direction, which is the marginal taxes. And this way, as I said, and it's important, will make those small to medium-sized companies attractive to foreign investors because they will be attractive not because of the Greek market or the regional market. Who cares, really, in, in, in a sense, allow me to say, because they will be global uh, companies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, the, um, one of the problems faced by the Greek economy even before the crisis, and it, and it got much worse, of course, during the crisis, is the, the lack of uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, now, we have here with us um, Mr. Christos Harbandidis, who is the president and CEO of Papastratos, a subsidiary of an international giant called Philip Morris. Uh, one of the biggest uh, foreign direct investments during the crisis was uh, by Papastratos. And he's going to talk to us about that and also about the challenges and opportunities of uh, the kind of transformation that the company is undergoing at the moment. Christo, podium or? I'm fine, both. All right, great. So thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. So as a, a proud member of the newly formed Competitive Council, and as one of the companies that still produce in Greece, here Deborah, uh, and as an American company that did invest in Greece during crisis, I would like to reconfirm the fact that Greece is moving out of the crisis. And here is another fact, Greece is hungry for growth. Yes, we are in a recovery path, but most importantly for me, we are in a verge of a much needed transformation. Uh, we need and we have started to uh, transform not only the economy but also the society. And this will uh, help us unburden our introversy, the introvert uh, path we have taken so many years, and enable us to follow global developments and do it immediately. The world is not waiting for us. So this transformation is a multidimensional, um, very important thing, but uh, I'm not expert in everything, so I will stay on the business slash economic uh, growth. Now, in order to unleash Greece's potential, of course, we need investments. Now, and we need investments that are forward-looking, job-generating, ideally related to technology, that are based to the competitive advantages that Greece has. We all know the challenges of the Greek economy, and we shouldn't wait everything to be resolved in order to invest. 
There are very clear advantages in the Greek economy, and besides that no one knows the geopolitical location of the country or uh, the great quality of life. Um, of course, the, the talent we have in Greece is, uh, is quite significant. It's the most educated generation uh, ever Greece had, and it's quite, quite comparable to other developed countries, even in an areas that um, we are lagging behind. What we observe is that we have quite agile, uh, driven people with can-do attitude, which is very important. Most importantly, Greece is uh, ready for change. And uh, I, I'm personally of the ones that uh, are optimistic because I've seen it happening. So Philip Morris International, an American company, uh, through the subsidiary of Papastratos, have scaled up investments during crisis in Greece. The last stage of, what, of which was an emblematic investment with uh, significant impact to the country's FDI, employment, exports, even, even agriculture. Um, and all this based on technology and innovation. For me, it's not about the two or three percent growth. For me, it's embarking to the transformation journey that the, the government has committed uh, to uh, pull through, and this should be a holistic, sustainable growth path. We, we have, everyone has to contribute. It has to be a growth strategy that will attract and take with it everyone, uh, public, private sector, but also the society and, uh, and the citizens. And I think Greece is ready for this now. And I'm not talking about a rebirth, any type of rebirth. I'm talking on embracing continuous transformation. Uh, this will allow us, this is what we should commit for, and this will allow us to, to make Greece an attractive destination for local, but mainly international investors, for now and for the future. And uh, sometimes with Mr. Vetas we debate, sometimes I'm more optimistic than politicians on this uh, front, but uh, um, I, I, do, I am optimistic because I, I have lived through it. So my company in Greece has been transforming for the last years successfully. And although countries are not like businesses, I, I see direct analogies. So what we have done is we, we recognized our problem early enough, the problem of smoking, and we committed that we will do whatever we can possible and even lead to, to lead the world uh, uh, to a world without cigarettes, and this took a lot of uh, courage. Uh, we had to re-establish our business model, the way we think, the, the way we operate. We, we try to change the, the way the world is looking at us. Um, and despite the unprecedented risk on, on what we are doing, imagine that the company Global is a company of 140 billion market cap company uh, from cigarettes, and we committed that we will replace cigarettes one day. So besides that risk, we built our roadmap, uh, we committed to it, and we start the journey. And three years after increase, uh, not only the business is stronger than ever, but we have brought a significant investment, 300 million uh, euros. Uh, we created 400 new uh, uh, jobs. We uh, boosted Greek exports on an innovative product, exporting in many countries in the world, including Japan, keep supporting the growers, elevating our um, sustainability efforts, both for the environment, but also the society, and more and more, and we continue. Um, countries are far more complex than businesses, I understand that, but I think I see the analogies. We have to have a bold vision in the country on a transformative, forward-leaning, and inclusive roadmap. We have to set the fundamentals of economic uh, growth, but at the same time, to reflect the needs of the society for today um, and for tomorrow. We have to plan long term, but also we need quick wins, desperately, and we have to do all this with transparency. We have to rebuild trust, and this is key, to our, with our key stakeholders, the Greek citizens, but also international markets, other nations. Uh, if I may, I can... Uh, from where I stand, I, I would like to close with an invitation. This is why I'm here. Uh, we are open to explain what exactly is happening in Greece for the people that want to invest, 
or are interesting about Greek reality, um, we are here today and in Greece to whoever wants to uh, keep contact uh, with us. I just want to say that we all in Greece understand that we have embarked in a marathon um, and in order to finish, we need to take small, steady, but quick steps going forward. We can do it because it has been done. My company uh, is, is a proof of a vision becoming a reality through hard work, through investments, through partnerships, uh, and above all, trust. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christo. And uh, the last but certainly not least, one of the most acute observers of the Greek economy, Mr. Nikos Vetas, General Director of EOV, which is uh, the best think tank in Greece uh, doing economic research. Um, a man not given to bouts of excessive optimism uh, will give us his take on the Greek economy. Nico. Okay, I'm, go I'm gonna start um, thanking Simeon and Alexis and all the gang. Um, not just for putting this together. Th this is more important than you think. And I'm going to explain why uh, towards the end of, of my brief comments. But being the fifth in the row here, uh, I have to be very careful not to repeat all the very important points that indeed have been made. Uh, I'm going to try to take a, a more macro look about how, about for, the, for the Greek outlook, which I believe is positive but under conditions. It's not unconditionally positive. Um, so um, uh, not everything I'm going to say is going to be pleasant. Let's, let, let's start, however, with all the positive things. Okay? The economic climate, which is a, a, an indicator that we measure at EOV every month, is at a 19 years high. 19 years is a long time. It covers not only the crisis years, but also the pre-crisis years and it tells you that Greek households and businesses are optimistic. And statistics have shown that this is an early indicator of actual investment and consumption decisions, so this tells us something. Also, we shouldn't minimize the huge importance that the fact that the borrowing cost of the country is coming down. We, will have, been, we have been asking for investment, we have been asking for transformation over the last few years, but this is really hard to be done when you are completely cut off from the world markets. And this is going to trickle down to households and businesses. This we do see also in reforms that have affected the public sector and businesses. This refers to large businesses that have linked themselves much better with the world economy than before. Small businesses, and there are many examples where they are sourcing local inputs and they are completely rethinking what type of businesses they should be. And we can name 40 or 50 that are really, really impressive. But even in the public sector, the fact that, for instance, all taxation is now digital, the fact that in the, in the healthcare all prescriptions are 100% digital, these are not small steps. And wrapping up all this, no matter how you measure it and no matter how you view that, both economic and political risks are now very low. Those of you that have not lived in Greece during the last 10 years or have not followed Greece for the last 10 years closely, you cannot imagine how difficult it is to do business for households to go through when you, have, when you, when you don't know how the next Monday is going to be. This was like a continuous bankruptcy over 10 years. Now we are in some sort of solid ground and we cannot afford allowing ourselves to go back. I'm saying this because there is a however. That's the next page. <laughs> yes, Jan. First of all, we shouldn't minimize the problems. Investment as percentage of GDP is almost stuck at about 12% when it used to be 24 or 25% pre-crisis, and that's also where the rest of Europe is. You cannot catch up if you are running slower than the others. 
And then, of course, FDI has been almost at the statistical level of zero during the last several years, despite the fact that there were two obvious places where FDI would go, and that's the non-performing loans for restructuring all companies and the privatization program. But leaving FDI alone, not all investment has to be foreign. That would be a mistake and is not sustainable. And if you look at the saving rate for Greek households as we speak, pre-crisis, that was about 9 or 10 percent of their disposable income. That's how much the average household would save. Today, this is minus 3 percent. Not 3 percent, it's minus 3 percent. So even the current level of consumption is not sustainable. Let's couple this with demographics. As we speak, the number of students in primary and secondary education in Greece is close to one and a half million. But we know now how many kids have been born during the last few years. And if you extrapolate over the next 15 when they all go through primary and secondary education, at the end of this period, the one and a half million children would only be one million. So we're gonna lose one out of three students in Greece which means that our universities are also gonna lose one of their three students, and the companies would not have, have people to work. And this changes completely the demographic, because given the current pension system in Greece, there's gonna be an enormous burden on the young generation if we are to keep pensions for the older generations where they are today. So what we're looking ahead is not just small battles. We still have a war. The next 10 years are going to be as important as the last 10 years. However, the country didn't collapse. That's not to be minimized. At the start of this journey, there were many and many and many politicians, journalists, businessmen that thought that Greece could not survive, that the, that the only way was to collapse. They, they were looking at the twin deficits together with the competitiveness gap, together with the debt, and they said, why don't you just press the restart button, okay? That would have been a massive mistake. Those people were absolutely wrong. Those were people uh, in Greece, people in other countries, people in this country. It didn't happen. It didn't happen, and the democratic institutions also survived. That's very important but we still have to climb some more hills. Now, if I sound a little bit um, worried, I am, but under conditions, I'm also extremely optimistic, but under conditions. And these conditions, if they were to sum up into one, is that the country has to become more open. More open in investment, trade, ideas and people. For growth, you need capital and labor, and as we speak, we don't have enough of either. The number of young Greeks, as I just explained, is going to be less and less, and many of them continue to leave, not just because they cannot find a job, but because they cannot find the institutions and the labor environment that they deserve. So there is a number of interventions that still have to be done, under which growth rates can indeed go higher to what they are today. What are they today? They're in the rough neighborhood of 2%, okay? But the fundamentals of the economy, unless things change, are to push us down closer to 1%. And if that happens, in seven or eight years from now, we will be talking about a new crisis. This should not be allowed to happen. Instead, we have to push forward I don't know about four, but something that's going to be systematic in the neighborhood of 3%. Now, this is easier said than done, especially if you are going to grow through exports at a time when your trading neighbors are actually getting into lower growth, and that's Europe. So we missed four or five years when that would have been easier. But anyway, at least we're wiser now. Let me just say two things because Yanis starts looking at me a little bit harsh. 
One is about um, public policy. Okay, there are all the things that one has to do to remove all the blocks and the resistance and all of these things. Fine. However, if the tax system and the pension system doesn't systematically support work and entrepreneurship, then we're going to find ourselves, if the forum happens next year, again at the same position. Greece still has a very large shadow economy. And taxes have to be distributed more evenly, not just for reasons that have to do with social justice, but for reasons that have to do with the economy. Looking back, what brought the crisis was not just an accident. I'm leaving aside how we dealt with the crisis. But it was an economy that, through which its main actors would prosper just because the economy was closed. This includes many companies, companies that either would have a monopoly position or they would all coordinate and they would persuade the minister not to allow further entry. This is done. If any of us thinks that we can grow through the old model, and there are some who think this way, they are completely wrong. And the words that Deborah used, which is being more competitive through innovation, that's, it, it's almost obvious, but it means there's going to be losers and winners. And public policy has to choose who they're going to promote. Just to finish with something that I guess um, on, on the one hand is going to sound a little bit optimistic, on the other hand, we shouldn't fool ourselves that Greece is just going to become a completely prosperous society in one or two years. We are looking <coughs> over a path that can be very interesting and very rewarding, but it's going to take a few years. Okay? And I'm saying this because people, businessmen, voters, can get easily disappointed if you think that the worst is over and now we are all rich and happy again. Sure. This is going <coughs> to be another path uh, which one can put on the map and then can follow it. The other reason that we have to be serious about this is because this is not just the job of one government. It's not enough for this government to be better than the previous one. It's not enough for this government to be better than the government that brought us into the crisis. The whole country had to gradually reform itself. Because if you are an investor, your horizon is not two or three years. Your horizon is not the electoral cycle. Your horizon is 15 years. So all of us, academics, journalists, everybody, has to look into this. Can it be done? If we decide that that's the way to go, open up, despite the fact that there is going to be some people that are going to be left behind if they cannot adjust, there is no reason, and I'm not going to elaborate on that, that Greece can become a hybrid of the Florida of Europe, and that's Mr. Theo Harris's job partly, but not only, and the Singapore of Europe, because there is all of this human capital sitting around, um, which, however, if it doesn't have a natural place where it's going to go, it's just going to leave. So under conditions, one has to be extremely optimistic, but we shouldn't forget that these conditions require additional work. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I could sense your inner struggle between your pessimistic and optimistic side at every turn of that uh, presentation. Uh, so I propose to, we have about 15 minutes left. I'm going to go uh, in the opposite direction with uh, questions. I'll ask you to be relatively brief in your responses. And of course, if someone wants to jump in and comment on what someone else has said, uh, feel free to. Uh, Nico, I'll start with you. Uh, one of the things you mentioned is the importance of getting tax policy right. Do you think the new government has uh, focused rightly its uh, tax cuts so far, or should it have done something different? OK, I can tell you what I like and what I don't like. <laughs> um, what, what I like is that 
they are proceeding towards an almost uniform decrease of tax rates in many, many categories from real estate. Um, this is good. First of all, there was some fiscal space created from the previous government. So it is not irresponsible to cut tax rates now. Plus, the additional growth is going to create additional fiscal space. It is not irresponsible, you said, right? Yes, it is not irresponsible. Okay? Uh, it's going to help growth. However, every tax determines the relative prices and pushes people to one or the other activity. And for the moment, it looks like the ones that get, that are more favored, but this is not something that, that is written in stone yet. The ones that are getting more favor than the others are uh, self-employed and a group of pensioners. Whereas what I would have liked to see is um, a more robust decrease in the burden on uh, middle incomes. Whether you do this through taxes or you do it, what I think is the best, through the pension system, which has to move away from uh, the current system, which is pay as you go and go towards a funded system that creates reserves, uh, is irrelevant. But you really have to reward people that systematically uh, have invested in human capital and then they require some return. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Christian, you want to add something to that? Yeah? yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Yes. Um, allow me to say about the taxation in Greece. Mm -hmm. You know, the funny thing about taxation in Greece so far was that the, as they call them, the legal entities, which is also uh, uh, companies, basically, uh, they, they had a very high taxation. And of course, the government did the right thing to... W what I think people don't realize is that this taxation of the legal entities in Greece are the prime growth engine of Greece. And really, the revenues from this site is about 8% of the total government revenues, right, more or less, coming from the legal entities. Therefore, and when you think about it, when I say growth engine, I mean that below this, the legal entities, this is generating much more tax revenues through VAT, more VAT, through more customs and things like that. Of course, pay for the workers, the social security, and so on. So wh wh what we would have liked at the Greek Entrepreneurs Association is to realize that and give even more emphasis on reducing the taxes on legal entities uh, even faster. We're not unhappy about what so happened. We're talking about the corporate profit tax? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, th yeah. because th this, this is the only tax that you can reduce and, and generate enough, securely I would say, I would dare say, enough revenues to, to reduce then the other about real estate, about, uh, mm -hmm. you know, make other things that Nikos is, is, is probably right. And that's what we've been, as a Greek Entrepreneurs Association, been saying the last, I would say, six years. Mm -hmm. It is, it, 8% of government revenues relates to legal entities, I repeat myself, which is really the engine of growth in Greece. That's what we should attack first and foremost. Again, no complaints for the Greek government, they, they, the new Greek government, they've done great things. We would have liked a little bit more accelerated in that. Since, since you have the mic, let me ask you what I wanted to, to ask you also. Um, just quite briefly, if you can explain to us why you think, from an insider's point of view, uh, aerospace can do so well in Greece, and, and whether you think Greece can actually do very well in other kinds of high-tech manufacturing, because it's something that really hasn't gotten much attention in the, in the public discussion. Yeah, uh, first of all, as I, as I said, we have the best Greek engineering. I'm sorry, the, the Greek engineering is the best value for money. I mean, myself, I, I, because we have co-production arrangements in Indonesia, India, and some other places, we could have very easily gone and hired Indian uh, engineers, which are, they are very good, or Romanian, if you want, a little bit closer. But really, I, and it's not because I'm pr personally prejudiced about Greek engineers, but they really, they have something that I cannot find uh, in, in other cultures. So that's number one. Number two, uh, again, because of the improvement in the overall security with the US, 
let's not forget uh, there are two countries in the world that really are top aerospace in, in our side of the world. US, number one, and number two is France. Because France, they're very good because of Airbus and civil aviation. And, and I, think, uh, I think a lot of those companies, again, we just, I don't want to speak a lot about our group, uh, but I have to say that all of a sudden now in an area, for, for example, uh, which is night vision, but that now we're gonna go to aerospace, we have French companies coming to us to subcontract mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. And we are very competitive. After this already after the American companies, but so we are very competitive. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, and people feel secure because Greece is a NATO country, EU country. They feel secure to transfer data, uh, to do those kind of things. And, and, and you know, it's Belgium tried that and they did very well already, mm -hmm. very well. They, they, had, they had no aerospace industry whatsoever. And they, they put emphasis on it and boom, it happened after a few years. Okay, great. Uh, Christo, uh, I know you cautioned repeatedly that uh, transforming a business is a different animal to transforming a, a government, a public administration, but is there something that you learned from the effort to, to get your people out of their comfort zone and to embrace new goals, uh, a, new, a new approach that could be of use to the continuing and, and Herculean effort to, to change the Greek public administration? Thank you for the difficult question. <laughs> Public sector, is, public sector is quite a, a very difficult uh, opponent to fight with. Um, looking at our transformation, it was practically a three-dimensional one. We had to change our business model, our product. We had to change the way the world sees us, and we had to change the, the way we think and operate, our internal culture, but the way we operate as well. And the last one was the most uh, difficult one. Um, we had to, and we have finished yet, to redesign the way the, the company is structured, um, the, the processes are made, and our mentality and behaviors. And this is even for a private company with very high commitment to uh, the vision we have, it is a very painful exercise. Um, that needs a lot of uh, a ve very clear strategy, very clear ways of working, but also very uh, continuous communication with the people on what is changing and wh why at every point, at every stage of uh, a time. So this would be the recipe I would recommend to any other business uh, to follow in order to succeed in any big transformation. I see it very hard for the public sector, uh, still, uh, we have to clarify the vision, structure it very well, explain to our uh, public sector servants why, why, what is changing and why, and with co continuous communication to uh, go through this process. Um, an overall idea for me stuck in, in, in my mind on everything we are doing in Greece today is personal responsibility. And on that, even on your question, we have to make this click to the minds and the hearts of the people uh, that to, to, to each one of us to undertake their personal responsibility to make, to make it as a country. And this goes for the public sector as well. Okay, great, thank you very much. Uh, Deborah, you spoke a lot about this, the importance of R&D and, and how Greece is not doing very well in private sector R&D. Uh, we've seen some interesting cases of major US firms that have opened um, R&D or innovation labs in Greece, uh, Tesla, Pfizer, uh, EY. Uh, how do you explain that? And do you think that there's we might see more of that in the in the near future? Well, I was really. I was really emphasizing that there is not enough private sector R&D, and the government investment is not linked into the industrial infrastructure and companies of Greece, and, and I think there's great need and potential for that. Um, I think there are tremendous opportunities for uh, other uh, foreign U.S. and other companies to come to Greece because um, capital is not there for investment, so they want to do that, too. Again, the talent. But also, I think there's an, a recognition that there are some great potential areas to incubate in Greece, to kind of create laboratories. So one, Pfizer's interesting that they're coming. 
You know, Pfizer's a, a, a huge global enterprise. They have, you know, R&D centers all over the world. Um, they are always on the cutting edge of linking, you know, new materials and IT and things with the pharmaceutical regime. Why did they come to Greece? Now, I haven't seen the analysis of, of why. I'm sure they looked all over the world. They're doing AI there, so they're obviously tapping into that IT talent base. You know, I know, for instance, the Athens Stock Exchange has fantastic IT people. They all come out of University of Petras. But also, I'm sure they're very interested in the precision medicine and the emergence of healthy longevity as a real frontier of medicine. You know, you talked about the demographics, aging population, not having children. Greece does have a reputation for healthy longevity. And so it's interesting they're going to use AI and pattern recognition to understand. They may be incubating a whole new business in Greece. I think that's probably what they're doing. Okay. But I want to just emphasize, too, the comments here on the panel about opening up is very, very important. And one area where Greece needs the reforms very much is in the higher education arena. That's very outdated. I mean, it's my understanding, I may be wrong on this, but it's very hard to even bring foreign uh, experts to come and teach. Um, I know that's true at, at the American College in Greece. I could envision with Greece's leadership in the region and the Balkans and coming into the Middle East, a place that would be a huge education hub which would be a great, not only a great source of, of uh, revenue and all of that, but put you, as you were in ancient times, as an innovation hotspot. Anybody in the ancient world that wanted to learn and do anything had to come to Greece. All the schools and they went out throughout the world. So that's part of your heritage, but you've got to get a reform in higher education. It's really, really um, time for that. So there's some uh, encouraging initiatives by the new government on, on, on that front, and we'll see how they work out. Uh, last word uh, to the minister. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask, but of course also feel free to comment on anything else, uh, is about the, the, the flight to quality you mentioned. What uh, specific things you think the government can do to encourage that? And also, is it linked to protecting some of our more amazing destinations from the, the growing plague of over-tourism, which will undermine them as, as amazing destinations if we don't do anything? Well, both what you mentioned are uh, important. Specific global brands, global destinations that need to be protected. Um, and it's important that we tap on the knowledge, the blueprints of WTO and other international organizations on how to do that. And we're already uh, liaising with them to uh, put in place a system that will actually um, uh, protect those destinations. For example, we have the standard um, uh, link of uh, uh, sustainable tourism observatories, which we need. Um, and we have already in the uh, University of uh, Aegean one such recognized tourism observatory. Uh, I'm sure we can uh, cooperate with other universities as well or other entities to ensure that we build those observatories and try to be proactive in ensuring that we don't reach the levels of over tourism that other <laughs> destinations and other countries um, have seen. We're lucky in that respect. We have not reached the uh, levels of uh, tourism that threaten the actual destination. We have reached levels of tourism that put a stress on the infrastructure, mm -hmm. which is a different um, matter. We have to fix that as well, because the, at the end of the day, in terms of the experience of the tourists, you have negative um, effects. Um, but we also need to ensure that we manage the destination in a professional way, and we monitor the numbers, uh, how much energy is being used, um, garbage uh, that's being produced, et cetera, et cetera, to ensure that we are within uh, parameters and limits that uh, can be sustained from destinations, especially <laughs> Greek destinations which are closed economies, islands, uh, that's what we're mainly talking about. Uh, so the, the, the uh, ecosystem and the, the economic system is a very much um, a system which is uh, clearly delineated and um, closed off. <coughs> now, as far as how, how we move to more um, 
investments that are towards upgrading uh, the, the Greek project. Um, we need to rethink the development incentives and how those are directed. We need to also uh, look into uh, successful uh, things in the past. I mean, I don't want to uh, uh, denigrate what has already happened. If you look at the number of five-star hotels and four-star hotels, they have um, increased much more than the average number of hotels in the past, um, within the crisis, the past 10 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. So that means that there's been a lot of investment and that investment has been directed towards the higher end of the product. And this is what actually protects us from the competition. Greece has a number of advantages in the tourism sector compared to the region. Um, one is uh, that um, uh, we have uh, good quality um, service levels, uh, personnel and uh, infrastructure, private infrastructure. We have issues with the public infrastructure, which we need to address, but we have a, a good quality compared to other destinations. And also, we are a safe country <coughs> and a country that um, you don't need, uh, it, it's not a magic picture. You don't enter a complex and within the four walls of the complex you see a fantastic um, environment and then you open the door, come out and you see poverty, you see problems, you, you have insecurity, you cannot walk around, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those are the kind of images that you don't see in Greece vis-a-vis -vis, um, the north of uh, Africa or other countries that uh, you might have those kind of experiences. So we need to ensure that we um, play along those advantages. We, we saw them in practice. I'll give you a, a specific example. We had 10% um, close with closing with that. We had 10% increase in the number of French tourists this year, despite Tunisia or Morocco coming online and becoming price competitive. Uh, and despite the fact that there is a strong cultural link mm -hmm. between France and those kind of countries. So um, our brand name, the kind of product that we uh, provide and can provide in the future uh, is, uh, is what um, helps us uh, weather the international competition that we see coming up now. I want to thank you all very much. Uh, we, <coughs> we move directly. Uh, I'm going to re remind everyone that uh, everyone's invited to the lunch that is going to be held here at quarter to two, and uh, we move directly to the next panel, which is, uh, the topic is uh, digitizing government and the economy, and uh, the host is myself again. <laughs>